During the Civil War, there were thousands of battles and skirmishes throughout this nation. The state of Missouri is the second largest state to have these battles. Though Missouri isn't known for the large battles like Appomattox, Chattanooga, or Gettysburg, it is known for the small skirmishes. A map made by the Union War Department in 1865 placed seven of such activities around a certain Missouri town. Today, details of only two of these battles exist today. These are the battles of Clark's Mill and Veracruz. One battle was a five-hour cannonade, while the second battle, though low in numbers, consisted of local militia casualties. August 10, 1861. Companies C and M of the 10th Illinois Cavalry were given orders to leave the town of Marshfield and move into Veracruz, Missouri. Veracruz was the town seat for Douglas County at the time, and it was situated near the Veracruz Road. Veracruz is a small town, remote, and saw very little action. Placed 30 miles to Rockbridge and 30 miles to Ava, it was a small town on a very important road. The 10th Illinois had four basic orders to carry out. The first order was to secure the town of Veracruz, Veracruz Road, and the Old Salt Road. The second order was to monitor and try to eliminate enemy military in the area. Third order was to put a stop to the bushwhacking in the area, and finally help organize and train the local state militia called the 73rd Missouri Mounted Infantry. November 6, 1862. One year later, the battle begins to start. The day went as normal. The soldiers started the morning off with military drills and exercises. They ate lunch and continued the rest of the day flirting with the local girls and resting. Then, small patrols were sent out that night to threaten the local bushwhackers in a search for any Confederate forces in the local vicinity. November 7, 1862. It's pre-morning. It is early in the morning and the sun hadn't begun to rise when the first of the Confederate Army was spotted. A Union patrol led by Sergeant Taylor of the Illinois 10th Cavalry ran into problems four miles east of the camp. Seven bushwhackers ambushed the patrol, killing one Union soldier and then retreating. They spotted an encampment of Confederate forces of 300 to 400 men near Pylon's store north of Gainesville. The patrol then made a swing back east to where Brush Creek runs to Bryant Creek. Just short of the junction, they ran into another Confederate army moving north, containing several hundred men, horses, and wagons. Being as quiet as they could, the patrol started headed back to Veracruz when they almost ran headlong into a rebel patrol. Luckily, they heard the patrol and stopped before they could be spotted. They then quietly walked their mounts until they reached Bowling Springs when they remounted and rode hard back to Veracruz to tell Captain Barstow what they saw. Early morning. The Union camp just started to stir when Sergeant Taylor came screaming into the camp telling the captain what the patrol saw that night. Hearing the news, Captain Barstow sent out two more patrols. One patrol, led by Lieutenant McClure, was to make a sweep towards Falling Springs, while the second patrol, led by Captain Barstow, made a sweep towards Rock Bridge. 9 a.m. Five miles north of Rock Bridge, Captain Barstow's men came upon a front patrol of the Confederate Union. Without any covering, the two units started firing. The skirmish only lasted for a short minute until the Confederates turned and ran south leaving behind nine dead soldiers and several dead horses. The Union forces lost only two men, with two more wounded, and eight horses lost. They then made a mad dash back to Veracruz to tend to their wounded. 10 a.m. Shortly after the patrol returned, Barstow immediately sent out pickets in every direction and dispatched messages about the battle and the request for reinforcements from Lawrence Mills and the Union headquarters in Marshfield. The messenger sent to Marshfield was gone only a short while when he came back reporting that there were many Confederate soldiers in the cornfields just short a distance up the Veracruz Road. The picket soldiers to the east and south returned within a few minutes to report the same thing in their area. The messenger of Lawrence Mills was the only messenger to get through the enemy lines. The patrol sent out earlier to guard Falling Springs returned with reports of 300 to 400 soldiers coming towards Veracruz. The captain, seeing that they were practically surrounded, began setting up his defenses. First, he planted his two cannons to cover both roads and directions. Then he divided his troops into two groups, one to watch the north road and one to watch the south road. 11 a.m. A loud explosion is heard on the bluffs overlooking the town on the northeast side of Bryant Creek. The Confederate Army opened fire with four six-pound cannons. The first round of the bombardment was accurate. 
The first cannonball hit the house of George Davis and smashed the only cast iron stove in the town. The second round of cannon fire hit the courthouse, damaging it beyond recognition. By this time, everybody in the town of Veracruz was running for the hills to the southwest to put an effort between the distance of themselves and the cannon fire. Finally reaching the top of the hill, the townspeople stopped to watch the battle in progress. Miraculously, no citizens were hurt. Not expecting the Confederate forces to have cannons, Barstow was caught completely by surprise. He immediately moved his cannons in position to return fire. Virtually, no small arms fire occurred because neither side carried weapons that were accurate over 100 feet. Even though the Confederate army greatly outnumbered the northern troops, any charge made towards Veracruz was ineffective because of Barstow's cannon fire and Veracruz's location. The town was set in the bend of Bryant Creek, with the bank of the creek being at least 12 feet high, the only cut in this bank being an 8 foot wide ford. Placing a few soldiers behind the trees near this funnel, Barstow was able to hold back the Confederate army for nearly five hours. 415. A Confederate soldier was spotted carrying a white flag walking down the hill towards the Union camp. The soldier was allowed to enter carrying a letter from the Confederate commander, Colonel John Q. Burbridge, offering him terms of surrender. Once reading the letter, Captain Barstow called all of his officers in a huddle to discuss the situation. The Union troops had only 20 rounds of shot for their cannon and a short supply of firearm ammo. Barstow had no choice but to surrender. When Colonel Burbridge got Barstow's reply of surrender, he walked into the town of Veracruz. 5 p.m. The Union forces are stripped of their gear, horses, cannons, and valuable possessions. They were then released and forced to march in the depths of winter, 100 miles away to Marshfield, with only light clothes on their back. By the end of the battle, the Union lost a total of 11 men, and the South lost 37 men. <laughs>